Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, December 15th, 2016. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Marshall Schott and Malcolm Fraser from Brewlosophy.com share two experiments relating to the boiling of wort. First, what happens when you boil with the lid on the kettle? Second, what effect does not boiling a Berliner Weiss have on that beer style? If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through the basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And if you buy any of our DVD combos, you get a free basic brewing bottle opener. And don't forget to get a copy of our brewer's logbook. You can use it to log and track up to 50 batches of beer. You can follow me on Twitter. My username is basicbrewing, all one word. We also have a Basic Brewing Radio and Basic Brewing Video page on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. And thanks to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site, especially during this busy, busy holiday season. Whenever you think of Amazon shopping, think of us first and go to basicbrewing.com. Click on our associate uh, link on the right-hand side of the page. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be helping us to bring this show. We greatly appreciate your support. And boy... As usual during the holiday season, uh, the list of uh, items is extremely long, and I appreciate that a lot. Uh, We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site as well. You can find our basic brewing iPhone app on iTunes, our Android app on Amazon.com. We have a, a Windows phone app. We're on the BlackBerry podcast directory. We're on the Stitcher app. We're on the Google Play Music, and we're on the iHeartRadio app as well. If you want to put a tip in our tip jar, some coinage in our virtual guitar case, you can go to basicbrewing.com slash support, and thanks to everybody who's done so already. Steve and I got together this week to shoot the annual bonus video for financial subscribers to the podcast. And in this year's video, Steve cooks up a really easy and delicious seafood spinach bake with cream sauce. Mmm! So good. If you're a contributor, you should see an email about that uh, within a couple of weeks from now. We have a good crop of uh, disaster stories for this year's End of the Year Disaster Show. Thanks to everybody who submitted one of those. And as I mentioned last week, the Brew Hauler folks are contributing goodies again this year for our favorite stories for prizes. Let's take a quick look into the mailbag, shall we? Keith from Trail, British Columbia writes, after hearing Chris and me talk about, uh, Chris Colby and me talk about tips to manage brewing time around the holidays. Keith says, I share your quest for a shorter brew day and use many of the tips from your recent show with Chris. I've thought about this topic a lot. I've been able to brew a five gallon or 19 liter batch on my traditional three vessel fly sparge system in three and a half hours. A couple of days ago, I brewed an amber lager, started at 1 p.m., and was cleaning the kettle at 4.30. Wow. That was with a 45-minute mash and a one-hour boil. I thought I would share my tips. Keith says, uh, first, crush the malt and prepare the water the day before. It takes planning ahead, but saves a lot of time. More BTUs, uh, or kilojoules. Uh, Brewing involves heating a lot of water. The more power, the faster you get started. Use a low, dead-volume louder ton. I started with a double bucket with hundreds of holes drilled in the inner bucket. It took forever for the wort to run clear. I now have stainless steel false bottom in a kettle, and it runs clear in a couple of minutes. Keith says, apply heat as soon as you start the runoff of the mash into the kettle. I skip the mash out and use the heat in the kettle to stop the mash reactions. Purists may argue against it, but if you keep the same timing, you will be consistent. Once the runoff is done, the kettle will be ready to boil. I use an immersion cooler and pump the wort back out, or out and back, to create a whirlpool, and the wort cools in about 20 minutes. Clean as you go. As soon as you're done with a piece of gear, clean it and put it away. That's good advice. At the end of the brewing... All you have to do is clean the pump, cooler, coil, and kettle. Uh, Keith says, I also find the pump helps. It added a few, or I added it a few years ago, and somehow my brew day was shorter. It makes the hot water transfers go faster. The mash, sparge, and boil are the critical path items. You can shorten them, but if shorten all the steps in between, you can keep a full mash and boil and still have a reasonable brew day. 
Uh, Keith says, the shorter brew time means I can brew more often and not just weekends. I can now brew in the evening after work. Well, thanks, Keith. Those are all good tips. Uh, efficiency is is good not only in the in the uh, mash tun, but in your process as well, I think. Let's talk about our sponsors, Desiree and Dave of High Gravity in Tulsa. Desiree and Dave came over yesterday evening to take a look at uh, Steve Wilkes' new shop in Fayetteville, Steve's Brew Shop. And I think they were impressed. And after the shop visit, Steve and his wife Gretchen and I uh, went with Desiree and Dave to get some beers and some pizza. And a great time was had by all. You know, Desiree and Dave shared the news that uh, High Gravity has found a new location in Tulsa not too far from their current location. Their current location uh, is being demolished, so they need to get out. (laughs) So luckily they found a, uh, it it sounds like it's even a bigger and better space than their current one, and it's nearby. And uh, so that's really good news. If you subscribe to High Gravity's newsletter, you've been reading about all kinds of holiday deals in your inbox. For instance, 15% off cheese kits until Christmas Eve. 10% 10% off Fast Ferment and SS Brutech Fermenters until December 24th. And 15% off wine accessories until Christmas Eve as well. Uh, plus, double brew bucks on all electric brewing systems until the end of the year, December 31st. So lots of great deals going on on uh, the High Gravity website. Uh, and you can check all of that out at highgravitybrew.com. And... Uh, it's good to support a locally owned, family owned brew shop. Next week, there'll be no podcast posted because of the Christmas holiday, but Steve and I will be back the week after for the disaster show extravaganza. But now, let's talk to Marshall and Malcolm from Brewlosophy.com on their experiments based on the boil. Marshall Schott, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Hi, James. Thanks, and happy Thanksgiving. Belated happy Thanksgiving to you as well. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Happy holidays, if I can be uh, too politically correct for some. (laughs) We are are in the thick of the holidays now, yes. (laughs) Uh, This is the first time that, uh, uh, that, that... We've had you guys on the show and have not had a triangle test for, uh, you know, Steve and me or or various other people to test. Uh, So we're just going to have to to trust that your results are accurate. (laughs) Yeah. And and, well, we felt like being really nice to you guys this time around. So we didn't send you anything. But uh, yeah, I think they're about as valid as uh, us garage scientists can make them. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we're talking about boiling. Uh, and in your half of this episode, uh, you boiled with the lid on and boiled with the lid off. What is the uh, what's the origin of this experiment? So uh, I think as most uh, home brewers know, whether they brew extract or with all grain, uh, there is a rule in brewing that that when you are you are completing the boil, the the typically sixty to ninety minute boil that you are to do so with the lid off because by not doing so it traps the condensate all of the uh the the stuff that would normally evaporate off uh that gets kind of caught up on the lid and then it drips back down into your sweet wort that uh that is going to become beer and in that condensate is what's called dimethyl sulfide which is d we know as dms uh which is said to impart yeah, a lot of people think it's cooked corn character. To me, it comes across as kind of like cooked cabbage with ketchup on it. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, and so to in order to avoid that, we've been uh, led to believe that by boiling with the lid off is one way to uh, volatize that compound and, and get mo- at least most of it uh, uh, out of the beer s- such that uh, when people are drinking it, it's below the flavor threshold. And I've heard even uh, some people say that uh, you know, don't even put the lid on when you're chilling the beer. You know, when you got your immersion chiller in there, or you, you know, just d- leave the lid off and you know, let all that stuff out. Right. I mean, the it's it's obvious uh, that the reason manufacturers of kettles sell lids is so that they can ruin your beer. I mean, that's <laughs> <laughs> that's what I've heard as well, though. That, that any any potential opportunity for the for the evaporation to be contained and dripped uh, and, and, and basically put back into the wort is a recipe for disaster. Now, 
I don't. I leave the lid off during the boil, but it's for a different reason. Uh, the last time I, I even put a lid partially on the kettle, it boiled over uh, because uh, you know the steam got trapped in there, and and uh, you know it, it got superheated or whatever happens during a boil over. And there was you know I walked away and came back to a mess. Yeah, and that's you know it, the the heat obviously you know boiling is a function of the amount of heat that is that is contained in the in the kettle, and when you put the uh, when you put the lid on, it's gonna it's gonna trap more of that heat. I've never as a as a good rule abiding home brewer, I've never actually boiled wort with the lid on. So this uh, uh, you know five hundred batches uh, since I've been doing this thing, five hundred plus batches this is the first time I've ever boiled with the lid on, and I'm and I'm glad I have these were five gallon batches and fifteen gallon kettles. Uh, because as I started to notice the steam kind of, you know, blowing out of the side between the seam of the lid and the kettle, uh, I, I, I gave a little peek and sure enough, the, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the boiling, the, 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 I don't even know what it's, it's like what I would call croissant if it was in a carboy was just barely, <laughs> but just about ready to pop, pop the lid off. So it, <laughs> yeah, it's a real, that's a real thing. It's, it can be a mess. So did, uh, well, let's talk about the experiment. How did you structure the experiment? So uh, basically, like, like with most of the experiments that we do, we try to do uh, everything possible to contain the variable to uh, the, the, the single thing we're trying to test. So we try to really restrict the influence of external or extraneous variables. Um, so for this one, uh, basically what I did is a, is a, uh, a larger single mash, um, and then I collected all of the sweet wort for a 10-gallon batch, what, what, what would typically be for a 10-gallon batch, collected all of the sweet wort, uh, gave it a good stir to homogenize everything, and then I split off half of that into a separate kettle. So I had two kettles with the exact same amount of the same exact wort from the same exact mash. Um, and then from there, what I did is I got the flame going under <clears throat> under the... Uh, the the lid off batch um, about 20, 30 minutes beforehand. Um, and then as soon as that one was up and going, I, I hit the flame underneath the lid on batch and boiled both for 60 minutes. They both got the same amount of hops at the same, uh, you know, same, same additions, same, same time. And, uh, and then were treated otherwise exactly the same. Um, so, so really the, you know, what we can say is that unless something, you know, mystical came along and, and, and did something different to these to these two batches, they were treated exactly the same, with the exception of whether the lid was on during the boil or not. Did you see a difference between the vigor of the boil and/or the amount of heat that you had to apply to each kettle? So, that, uh, good question. The um, <clears throat> excuse the coughing. I'm just getting over a cold. Uh, <laughs> we uh, so the like you were mentioning the 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 batch with the lid on did did require turning down the gas just a, just a hair because I have natural gas and so I have a little valve that I can control the 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 gas flow on um it was it was boiling very very vigorously um and I boiled both I the, the one with the lid off I, I just tend to boil vigorously anyways um so I had that one going pretty strong as well uh what was probably the most what, one one of the more surprising aspects of this uh, was what I observed in post boil volume, wort volume. I expected because the lid was on the entire time, I expected the lid on batch to have, you know, to not lose too much volume um, and to have a, you know, a little bit lower specific gravity uh, post boil OG. Um, and that's that's just not what we found. In fact, uh, the, the the post boil volumes were about exactly the same. The um, the OGs were were right around the same. So whatever escaped through the seam between the lid and the and the kettle, it seemed was roughly similar to what was leaving the open, you know, the open kettle. Huh. So there, I mean, there wasn't. Uh, when you think about it, I mean, the, the stuff that drips back in is just on the surface, the undersurface of that uh, of the lid. Uh, so that's not, you know, it's not tr a tremendous volume at any one time, I guess. Yeah, you know that, and and I there, there were there were actually a few times where I would I for about I mean it couldn't have been longer than a second where I would just real quickly pick, kind of pick up the um, the lid on the lid on batch and kind of shake the condensate back down into the back down into the boiling wort just to get it all in there you know really mm -hmm. maximize the effect. What was the recipe like? Oh, good question. Let me pull that up here. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Well, it, so the beer, here we go. 
You asked the hard questions at the, at the wrong times. <laughs> okay, I'm pulling it up. Uh, let's see. It was a fest beer. Oh, that's right. So this was a um, – the recipe was – uh, for the so so what I do when I do these split uh, split pre boil split batches so I'm I'm doing a, a lar- one single large mash splitting the wort after the mash is I'll actually design uh, like basically like an 11 gallon batch and then split those e- evenly so for the 11 gallon batch the recipe was uh, 17 and a half pounds of Pilsner malt uh, about five pounds four pounds 15 ounces of Vienna malt because that's all I had left and uh, and then I just hit it with a pretty pretty standard, um, you know, uh, uh, hop bill of about, about 20 IBU of Magnum at 60 minutes and then, um, a couple ounces of, of spalt, um, spalt hops at, uh, 15 minutes. So was it fermented to, with, oh, go ahead. For the, for this uh, experiment, was it important to have, uh, lightly kilned, uh, base malts? Yeah, sure. That's, that's one of the, that's one of the big arguments and uh, is that, uh, it's the lighter the kiln, the more, the higher SMM is actually in the, uh, is in the, you know, unmashed, the, the uncrushed grain. And that, and that once it goes through that, the mash process, it's converted that, um, I'm not even going to pretend to know how to say SMM, what it really means, but it's converted <laughs> in, it's converted into DMS. And then, and that's what we're trying to get out of the wort before we ferment it. And there's some, you know, there's some evidence out there that, that, uh, DMS can also be created during the fermentation process. And in fact, some contaminants can, can, uh, produce, produce it as well. Hmm. So the theory is that, uh, that if you, if you kill a, a base malt for a longer period of time, it takes, takes care of those problems before it gets into the mash done in the kettle, right? Uh, it takes care of most of it. I, I was reading some research that, that that still found that there is there is definitely SMM present in some of the more highly kiln malts like Munich malt and whatnot. Just that it's so low that even without uh, you know even without a vigorous boil necessarily the um, the amount of DMS that's present in the finished beer is just below the flavor threshold. And this ties in with the with an earlier experiment that you did uh, with boil length, right? Yeah, we've done a few boil length experiments, actually. Uh, the first one using, you know, standard pale malt, two row. Um, and then the other one um, using, you know, Pilsner malt, uh, same same thing. And, and in those, we actually did a, uh, for the Pilsner malt, which most people know, you know, or, or hear that they're supposed to boil a, 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 a wort that is uh, consists mostly of Pilsner malt uh, for 90 minutes to, to drive off all that DMS. And, and so we, we compared a 90 minute boil to a 30 minute boil. Only thing we adjusted for was the, you know, the water volume used, uh, for mashing and sparging so that, uh, they, they were the same OG at the end and, uh, no one could tell those apart either. Hmm. And I couldn't even, I mean, they were so similar. They were, there was a slight color difference and that was about it. Okay. So, so back to our, uh, uh, covered slash no covered experiment. Were there any differences in the performance during uh, fermentation? No, everything, in fact, uh, seemed to really be aligned. Uh, there was there was really no difference that I could tell. Um, I can't seem to find the photos on this on this uh, page right now, and I'm talking to my developer about it. Uh, <laughs> but but the but the. Um, what I recall is that fermentation, um, uh, fermentation vigor, the the look of the croissant, um, and and the final gravity at the end were all within what I would call a pretty standard margin of error. I mean, there was n- it was nothing significant enough in the differences that I noticed that I would say, "Ooh, wow!" You know, there it is. And um, I, you know, for all intents and purposes, they were the same. And color and clarity of the finished beers. Uh, my, that's yeah, they looked about the same to me. Ah, huh. wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, so the so the you know the 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 numbers all all seem similar, but how did the uh, the tasting or the sensory panels uh, shake out? So we on this one we um, I was able to convince twenty twenty victims to uh, <laughs> to participate in the uh, data collection of this experiment. Uh, they with twenty people. Uh, we would need to have 11 of them get it correct to uh, say that there is a statistically significant um, uh, ability for people to distinguish between the beers. Uh, in, in essence, uh, they were ser- so, so all the tasters were served two samples of the beer that had the lid on when it was made and one sample of the beer with the lid off. Uh, of those 20, 11 would have had to get, get it right and only eight did, which uh, is you know just a hair over one third, which is the expected 
um, rate at which people would get it right if you know you got three options mm-hmm. uh, by chance. So the fact that that you know two people less than what would be required for significance uh, got it allows us to say that they're really um, the panelists were unable to reliably distinguish uh, a beer that had the wort boiled with the lid on from from the same exact beer with the where the wort was boiled with the lid off. So the there goes another uh, <laughs> another tenant uh, of home brewing. Uh, I know. <laughs> of course, you know we always have to say that this is one experiment, uh, and you know its repeatability is is the the proof uh, or backs up the proof of something like this. Um, but is there is there any advantage that you could see from from leaving the lid on? So there, are, you know. The I, I this is one of the things I always wondered too. Why do you boil with the lid on anyways? I mean, I don't I don't boil my spaghetti with the lid on. I don't I don't boil. I don't you know. I keep the lid off. Um, what I heard you know after the fact after we published this article was from people who were saying you know I I only I don't have an I don't have a burner. It's too cold or I or I just can't you know uh, uh, afford a burner right now to to boil outside. So I, I have to use my stove. And because of that, uh, the fact that with the lid on. It contains more heat, and it and it'll it, for some people that's the only way they can really achieve a, a really good boil, a vigorous boil, mm. and um, so the and and what's interesting is I you know like we say all the time this is a single data point you know blah 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 don't, don't trust this go try it for yourself or go look for more data whatever um, when we publish these articles nowadays we often hear back from just a ton of people saying ah yes you know i've been doing this for so long and i and and you know this this i've never noticed the dms or i've never noticed uh you know what you know whatever else it might be and so to me that's it's anecdotal and we get that but that anecdote does add a little bit to uh the slightly more valid approach that we're taking here and the results that we find i i i i just think that you know, again, because of perhaps the the modernization of of malting and and what we know about grains and process of of making the ingredients we use, we're able to kind of, you know, look at these rules in a, a in a different light. Is there any indication, or can you find, or have you found any information that this might be something that is more important on a commercial scale rather than just you know the five or ten gallon batch scale? It's, you know, I um. I wondered that, and it, it, one of the first one of the first times I ever questioned uh, this this you know rule to boil with the lid on is when I was going on a tour of a brewery up in the Seattle area, and like most you know I think most breweries that I've seen since then, larger fifteen barrel plus breweries, their boil kettles um, basically just have a chimney on the top, mm-hmm. and and it, it's it was hard for me to believe that all of the condensate and and all of the DMS that is that is supposed to be in this word is escaping through that relatively small hole on the top of their of their boil kettle, um, and and so that was kind of that was one of the first wedges in my conviction that boiling with the lid off is a requirement. Um, I I have to believe that commercial breweries uh, uh, you know do things for a reason, and and so, uh, but I but I can't find. You know, that I've had commercial beers that I think have DMS in it. Is it because they're not boiling with the lid off? I don't. I don't know. You know, there's the uh, anic- the anecdote of uh, Rolling Rock. Uh, you know, in the old days before they got acquired, uh, that the that Rolling Rock had a certain DMS or a certain corny characteristic that was, um, you know, that was a characteristic of the beer and and when uh, they were acquired by Anheuser-Busch the story goes that uh, Anheuser-Busch had to kind of dumb down their you know their methods of of making the beer to kind of make it uh, so that it tasted uh, like the original beer of course you know that could be just a story yeah i've heard the same story and in fact um i wish i could remember who it was but they shared with me this a person shared with me an article uh that was essentially kind of tr- backing up that story by people who worked for Rolling Rock or something like that, 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 that was a, that was a character that they were going after and really looking for how they got it in there is what gets me. I mean, I, we have tried as home brewers, you know, we, we, we tend to be viewed as, as, uh, uh, you know, a lot that can mess things up fairly easily. We have tried time after time and you'll talk with Malcolm about, about uh, his experiment, but, but we've tried time and again to get DMS in beers and it seems to be a struggle. In fact, when we, uh, we recently did a, um, an experiment where I intentionally dosed, um, some, some really pale, clean lager bit burger, uh, with DMS flavor standards from flavor active. And 
you know, I, I had, uh, you know, one set, I did the same old triangle test and had, you know, one of the cups had this, this intentionally dosed and it was something like six times the, the expected flavor threshold for most tasters. <laughs> and, and I presented that I only had so much, so I was able to present it to 10 or 11 people. And, um, you know, only three of us, I, I include myself cause I was one of, one of the few who could get it right. were able to consistently pick the one with the DMS and the, and I think the more interesting thing to me was even among the people who got it right, um, I'm not sure any of them, I don't have it up in front of me now. I'm not sure any of them were able to identify what the off flavor was hmm. or what it was that made them think that it was different. They were consistently able to do it blindly. Um, but you know, it says to me that, that what we know about these off flavors may not be as much as we think. <laughs> I mean, no offense when I say that to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, my, uh, uh, you know, I've made a, made pilsners before, and I've made uh, you know made them with uh, with corn, and I've made a cream ale with corn or flaked maize, uh, and I tell myself that that there's a you know kind of a a corny flavor that comes from that, um, you know. But how much of that is you know is just uh, me tricking myself, uh, or how much of it is you know the character of some of the noble hops, or so, you know who knows uh, what uh, what that is. Uh, yeah. You know, it's it's uh, in the style guidelines, you know, a little bit of the the corny flavor, the DMS flavor in, in uh, uh, Pilsner is acceptable, I, be I believe. And, and you know, my my hunch is that it's a confluence of factors that these that certain things. Uh, so I, I have a theory. I'm, I'm developing my own personal theory that I'm, I'm not going to share with anyone in the public eye. OK, so but I'm going to tell you right now privately. <laughs> <laughs> so so my theory is that what we have come to identify as off flavors are um, not so coincidental coincidentally um, also similar to the flavors that we get in the ingredients we're using for the beers those off flavors off flavors are most common in so um, if you ever take a if you if make yourself a simple 100 percent Pilsner malt um, you know smash beer ferment it with you know o1 boil it for two hours um, do you know do everything you can to eliminate the 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 potential for DMS to be in it and taste it with with very little hops um, I've done this many times and what I taste is that really grainy uh, kind of like earthy uh, what some I think pick up is a kind of a corn like character mm -hmm. and 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 I and it, you know is it a, is it a function of just our imagination or, or, or trying to kind of confirm what we're expecting probably. But, but I also think there's a very real character there that, uh, that a lot of us just don't know that well. Um, you know, most of us are so used to, and I, and I, I'm, I guess I'm speaking real generally here, but I think most of us in America these days is we're really used to over hopped, you know, low malt character, uh, low yeast character, um, ale. And so when we are when, we're, when we've been led to believe that that lager is is very difficult to make and 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 you know if you, if you if you don't do this and that and this you're gonna have it's gonna screw up and so we taste these beers that are made really simply and clean and even if it's not there we're looking for it and we're looking so hard sometimes I I think we find it uh, maybe when it's really not there there you go which is why triangle tests are important. Uh, they, you yeah, know. certainly fun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you were wrong. <laughs> well, well, well. The good news uh, about this episode is that Steve and I are still tied on the triangle yeah. test. So uh, <laughs> we'll see what we can do about uh, about shifting the numbers here soon. I... <laughs> <laughs> All right, Marshall. I appreciate it. It, it. it was fun as always. Oh, as always. Thanks again for having uh, both Malcolm and I on. It's wonderful. Malcolm Fraser, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. It's always a pleasure, James. Thanks for having me back. I talked to Marshall about uh, his boil experiment. Now we're going to talk about boiling with you as well. So what are we talking about here? Okay, so we did a Berliner Weiss experiment, and we compared a Berliner Weiss wort which was boiled versus one that was not and served them blindly to a group of participants. And... Uh, we can talk about the rest of that later, but essentially wanted to see if people could tell. So what what was the inspiration to me? Why why do a no boil Berliner Weiss? Okay, so there's uh, there's a trend in which I try to dive into 
certain beers and I, I get into their history a little bit and it's not always to reproduce a historically accurate beer. It's just kind of get into the gist and in like the, the inspiration of the beer. And I, I find the beer's history exciting. And so when I was going through uh, Ron Pattinson's page from shut up about Barclay Perkins and also reading a, a PDF presentation from uh, two instructors from the VLB. I think it's Kurt Marshall and uh, Brughard Meyer. They have a, a a PDF out there, which you can search, you can internet search for that. And, uh, I noticed that certain, certain brewers, uh, ma- uh, manufacturers of the Berliner Weiss didn't boil, uh, at all. And there was a practice amongst home brewers now, in which some people are advocating don't boil the work because you lose that fresh doughy malt taste that, you know, you basically, blow off volatilize if you if you boil the 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 beer or the wort you know aggressively so there were some that did boil there were some that didn't boil there were some that did a mix you know so i tried to take the two extremes and no boil versus a boil but there's a catch there so some people will will start waving their hands at some purists and, and say hey the reason why some of those beers were not boiled is because a decoction was performed well i didn't perform a decoction because i don't think most home brewers do, you know, for, for better or worse. Right. And, you know, that caused, you know, some consternation amongst some purists. And I understand that because, you know, knowing the history of the beer, but I was surprised to find that there were some, at least one documented brewer that didn't boil and performed an infusion mash. So it wasn't like it never happened, hmm. you know? So what what are the benefits uh, supposedly of boiling? I mean, why would you want to boil as opposed to not boil? The advantage of not boiling for a Berliner Weiss is to maintain that fresh doughy uh, malt character that some people had have reported existed in a historically accurate uh, Berliner Weiss, right? So it depends on w- which time frame you take, like pre-1900s or early 1900s or, or middle 1900s. There's almost three sets of of Berliner Weiss. Now, so some did not boil for that reason, maintain that fresh doughiness, and a decoction was performed instead. But there were some that did an infusion, uh, only an infusion mash. Now, the boiling for a Berliner Weiss is just going to be like any other beer. You know, you get sterilization of the wort, you get uh, protein coagulations for clarification, and isomerization of alpha acids. Now, very few of, of modern Berliner Weisses and some of the older ones made made very little use of uh, of hops at all. You know, if they did use them, they they would put them in like uh, in the mash during the caution. You know, because of the sensitivity of lactobacillus to alpha acids, you mm-hmm. can inhibit it can inhibit the souring action quite a bit. Now, because especially the modern technique, which is like a a rehash off of the uh, – I might mispronounce his name, so sorry, German listeners. Uh, Franke, me- the method, it's like F-R-A-N-C-K-E. So he, he wrote a book uh, on Berliner Weiss, and he is often referred back to quite a bit about uh, the, the modern souring method for Berliner Weiss. So what he does is he, he recommends a, you know, a mash. Uh, it can be decoction or infusion. And then a souring phase, which is lactobacillus, various strains. And then you can or you cannot uh, and you know, pasteurize that wort. And then you go through a fermentation. So you can after pasteurization, you can uh, boil it or just pasteurize it or nothing. So you, you kind of have a choice there. So what we did for this experiment was one got no boiling. And one got pasteurized. Uh, uh, yeah, both got pasteurized. One was boiled after the souring. One was not. It was diverted directly to a fermentation vessel. So the uh, the one who that didn't receive any boiling whatsoever, you're essentially putting uh, live lactobacillus into your fermentation vessel, right? Yeah. So you know, some people might say, "Well, it's two variables," and, and yes, that's that's true because uh, on the one that was diverted directly to a fermentation vessel, the lactobacillus, uh, lactobacillus is theoretically still alive and working. And, and we can 
th- that was evident in the final beers. The pH for that uh, that particular Berliner Weiss was about a full point lower. So they both came out of the souring uh, vessel at about 3.33 pH. And the one that was boiled dropped down to about 3.25. And the other one went down to like 3.15, I believe. Hmm. So the lacto continued to work. Well, that's, that's the theory. The lacto continued to work in that beer. So talk about the talk about the recipe and talk about the procedure. Okay. Uh, the recipe is a very basic. It's just roughly 50%. German wheat and pilsner, and I went, I went with a very low kilned uh, German pilsner malt. Uh, I think it was like a 1.5 or 1.8 level bond. It's you know pretty light you, for the for the hope that the effect of potentially not off gassing uh, DMS SMM conversion to DMS would be evident. Mm-hmm. We've we've had a hard time getting DMS to show up in beers. <laughs> <laughs> for better or worse, mostly for better, I guess. <laughs> so the so uh, and no hops, right? Yeah, I I did no hops because I didn't want a chance uh, inhibiting any of the uh, lactobacillus. So I use uh, Ultimate Flora, which is a off the shelf a probiotic, and you'll, you'll hear some people use Good Belly. A lot of the guys over at Milk the Funk will use Good Belly. Uh, some people will use commercial strains. I haven't had much luck with them except for, uh, if I don't mind a plug, but uh, Omega Yeast Labs has their lacto blend, and I've used that professionally and for home brewing to good success. Hmm. So the uh, and I think you basically talked about the procedure. I mean, you had a souring phase uh, where you soured the entire wort all together, right? Yeah. So I'm sorry, I kind of uh, skipped over that. So I did one big mash. So I made one uh, 11 gallon mash, 11 gallons worth of wort, uh, or four 11 gallon batch, I should say. So I made the the beer. It's 50, about 50 50, you know, wheat and, and pills, and I used a little bit of Munich for uh, color and and a little bit of that breadiness too. Probably wasn't needed in this one, you know, but I, I just typically use a little bit of uh, light Munich. Now I mash low because you know these beers tend to be, uh, you know. Mostly low, uh, low finishing gravity. You want them like you know 1.005 to uh, 1.008, probably the max. You mm-hmm. know, um, so I mash low. I mash you know for at least an hour. I, I don't check for conversion anymore. I haven't had a problem with that. And then uh, I, I batch sparge because it's it's quick and convenient and consistent. So for these experiments, batch sparging really does work uh, well for us because it takes out another, you know, potential variable. Uh, I drain that to another vessel. Now I usually do it to my boil kettle and I wrap it with a heater. I made like a reptile heater and I try to keep it around 95 Fahrenheit. That seems to be a, a good temperature for a lot of, a lot of the strains in particular, uh, plantarum. So I go into my vessel about a hundred by the time I'm done with the transfer because of the thermal mass of the, of the vessel and the air cooling, I end up around 95 and then I add my, my probiotic and I pre-acidify the entirety of the, the now wort to about four point, I'd I'd say 4.6 plus or minus one, uh, point one. And I do that for a couple of reasons. I'm maintaining foam stability. You want to deactivate those proteolytic enzymes, which can degrade uh, foam in, in in the head of the beer. And it also kind of gives the bacteria a head start and kind of keep any uh, non-preferred microbes at bay. Mm-hmm. So uh, the Ultimate Flora blend that I use, it's real aggressive. I mean, we're talking 12, 18 hours. I'll be, at, I'll be from 4.7 pH down to, you know, 3.2 or better. So wow. it, it works. It works really quickly if you can maintain temperature. So this time, if you go to the article, you'll see I didn't use uh, my kettle. I used a cooler. Uh, I don't know why. I was just trying something different. So I used a one of those beverage coolers, and it held temperature really well. So I think I pasteurized it with a heat stick, like you might see for heating 
you know, livestock animal, uh, water. Mm-hmm. I brought it up to 170, held it there for about 10 minutes, and then I cooled it down to about 100. Uh, you know, stirred it, let it get down to about 95, and then I added my lacto. That was a late night uh, brew session. I, I like doing the Berliners because I can do part of it the night before and then come back the next day, usually after work. My souring's done. And then if I'm boiling, I I boil it for only five, ten minutes max for most Berliner vices. For this one, because one of the things we wanted to check was you know DMS production and uh, and the flavor impact of the boil versus non-boil. So I boiled, I, I split after the souring was done. I split half of it into a ferment, fermentation vessel, which is just a carboy. I put it in a big tub of water in my garage because the time of year I did this, my garage is pretty constant at 68 degrees, so I was lucky. And then the other half of the wort I boiled, but I boiled it for 40 minutes, which is much longer than I normally do. But once again, I wanted to exaggerate the the conditions of boil versus no boil. So I boiled it down, and then of course now I'm going to have a more concentrated wort, right, sugar-wise. Mm-hmm. So I I diluted it back to the original volume. Uh, so basically, I had two Berliner vices that started their fermentation at, I think it was a uh, 1.034 uh, original gravity. So I'm, I'm looking at photographs on the article, uh, and at one point, uh, the uh, the boiled wort looked more cloudy than the uh, than the not boiled in the at least in the the hydrometer tube. Yeah, isn't that counterintuitive? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I don't boil my 100 percent rye, uh, you know, sour wort beers. Uh, and they, you know, they're just as cloudy as they can be. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I can't explain that. I, I really can't. I, I don't know what happened. Uh, yeah. And, and funny enough, if you look at the final picture, the no boil ended up, ended up, uh, clearer as well. The, the no boil beer was in, ended up clear. I don't know if I, I don't know if I set like a permanent haze with the uh, polyphenol reactions. You would think that the boiling that's part that's part of the reason why you boil. You think I would create the requisite collisions, create heavy particles, and it would drop clearer. Mm-hmm. That's that's why we. That's one of the reasons why we supposedly boil. It was very, very odd to me. Yeah, and in, in addition to the clarity, the 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 boil portion, which you might expect, is a couple of shades darker. Yeah, yeah, and that makes sense. That falls in line with with uh, conventional wisdom, I guess. Right. You know. So, so you took it on to taste panels, and what were the results? Okay, so this might be one of our our most staggering uh, lopsided results. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I'm looking at the article here. Thirty seven people were tested you know, of various experience levels. We had you know high ranking judges, professional brewers, and some random people from the crowd because uh, this was held at a a local brewery. Uh, called Insurrection, and they've been real great to support. I, I get lots of local support from the breweries. I'm, I'm pretty lucky, but uh, Insurrection was was willing to step up for this one because he does the brewer there, Brad Promozik. He does some of the uh, sour beers. You know, he does like he likes to keep his his lacto alive. He's he's kind of into that. Hmm. You know, maintain the culture, maintain the culture. So he wanted to see the results of this one because he was interested because in, it's. You know, he uses some of these techniques. So, But 37 people, uh, two were given the no-boil and or they were given two samples of the no-boil and one sample of the, the boiled. And 31 tasters, 31 of the 37 were able to identify the odd beer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it, it wasn't even close. Uh, essentially, when I was taking samples, I, I could smell it. You know, normally when I'm taking my samples for gravity readings and, and pHs, I label it. You know, I'll say no boil or boil, you know, with a little marker. <laughs> I didn't have to. <laughs> you, could, you could smell the difference. You could see the difference. You know, it was, it was so – I was actually more surprised that six people got it wrong. Yeah. So what were the, what were the preferences? What did people like? Well, that was odd. A little bit surprising for me because I didn't prefer the the no boiled. I think 
I, I either have some DMS, uh, DMSO uh, byproduct left over, or there's it's DMS itself, or there was a secondary side issue which causes. So people will talk about DMS how it can be corn, mm. but there's also some DMS reactions which can result in more of a cabbagey and garlic smell. And the the no boil beer had that uh, to me. Did they, I'm not sure because if you have SMM, which is the uh, S methylmethionine, that's the precursor for DMS, right? So when we heat it, it becomes SMM becomes DMS. Well, it can also become DMSO, which is uh, I think it's dimethyl sulfur oxide. Well, that can lay dormant and it has a very has a higher flavor threshold for some people, but some people can detect it. And it's like the garlicky smell, mm. but it can be scrubbed away. DMS and DMSO can be, can be converted and or scrubbed away during fermentation. Well, that beer, that no boil beer, oh, it, to me, it was not pleasant. It smelled like cabbage, you know, just, yeah, I, I just, I just didn't prefer it. cabbage and cheese, mm. you know? So I'm not sure if I got an infection in it, which is one of the risks of not boiling. Right. I mean, we, we know that, um, or if it was just loaded with DMS. So hmm. uh, now, funny enough, once you got past the initial waft, the smell of DMS and that little bit of cheese, the isovaleric, it was actually, I think it tasted better. <laughs> <laughs> it, it had it had that bread flavor. You know, it had like a, a raw, doughy, it smelled like bread when it's rising. You, you know, if you make fresh uh, yeast uh, leavened bread, it had like that smell. It was quite nice. But, so, so I wonder if you, if you, uh, instead of just boiling it, if you raise the temperature back up to say 170 or 180 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, and then you know chilled it down before pitching, you know maybe you would get the benefits of pasteurization of the boil without you know the whole uh, fully boiling uh, rate. Yeah, and you know just like every experiment, uh, births other experiments, and that was certainly considered. In fact. That was considered on the front end of this one, but we wanted to do the extreme first, boil versus no boil, and then we can start chiseling away uh, the what about this and what about that. And, and I think your your idea has merit, and other people have suggested similar. So you actually took it a step further than what we can read in the article on uh, brewlosophy.com, right? That's right. Uh, we had a volunteer. He has helped Marshall before with DMS testing and you know, basically – We've had a hard time having DMS show up both in flavor and uh, analytically. And the the gentleman who did it before, who I'll call Dr. Dan, he volunteered to analyze beers again. And this time we did have DMS show up. So now the the, the flavor threshold for, for DMS is so somewhere around 30 to 40 ppb with, with the B for billion. Mm-hmm. And so it's pretty low. And commercial beers can be anywhere from, say, 20 to 200, right? So there's some beers that are noted for their corny DMS uh, note. And in fact, some people believe that part of the German lager character is a little bit of DMS. Mm-hmm. You know, so that, that can be argued either way. So the alpha sample from his analysis had 140. He, he asked me to round numbers off, but a 140 ppb. So <laughs> 140 ppb, you know, compare that to the 35 ppb threshold for most people. And the Bravo sample still had about 52 ppb. Huh. So the boiled still had about 52 and the no boiled 140. Wow. So that, that that's – yeah. So it didn't just seem like we were smelling DMS. <laughs> it was loaded with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, wow. which is also, I mean, that's you know almost three times the amount of DMS from from the no boil to boil uh, the other way around. But essentially, that's why I didn't have to, you know, label my samples when I was taking them. You know, I, you could just basically pour it and go, "Yep, that's the no boil." <laughs> <laughs> so, so you th- you're thinking that there's a possibility. I mean, it could be the process, the the not boiling process, or you're thinking it could be the possibility of some contamination in the fermenter. I mean, you're not using hops, you know. That's that's right. a, that's another, uh, 
you know, you're not getting the antiseptic properties of the hops there. Yeah. Uh, no, I do Berliner Weisses quite a bit. I, I usually have them on tap. Uh, I've done decently with them in competitions and stuff. And this this wasn't a great Berliner Weiss on either side. I don't think it was a great beer. And I can, con- you know, somewhat confirm that by I entered it in a competition, uh, the the boiled one. And it only scored like a 28 or something like that. It was one of my worst ones. And I don't know, you know, what the issue was. I don't know. If I used a different yeast that I normally use. I, I used the cooler. You know, there were some things that, that happened, you know. But they weren't bad beers. They just weren't great beers. And, you know, not my best example uh, of the style on either side, certainly. So what are your conclusions? I mean, what, what do you take away? Boil your darn wort. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, it definitely has to be investigated further. You know, we, we like to say, you know, one test, one incident, you know, one uh, variable, my garage, yada, yada, yada. Now, I want to try this again with, with some different, you know, nuances to the experiment. But it just seems like it's safer. It it removes the possibility of getting a DMS bomb, Uh you get to keep your secondary, your cool side equipment clean. You know, I have one vessel now. It's, you know, lactose is actually pretty easy to kill. People treat it like it's, you know, the demon. But, you know, lactobacillus is, is relatively easy to kill. But, you know, that carboy is going to be a, a sour carboy now, which is fine because I have lots of sour beer going. But, you know, if you want to, you know, maintain that stuff all clean, your transfer tubing and everything else, it's easier just to boil after your souring step. Mm-hmm. And it seems to... Even I think it just creates a more locked in beverage. Like you, you kind of stop the process. You say, okay, I, my beer's at 3.33 pH. That's kind of where I want it to be. I'm going to boil. You know, it takes away that. You scrub more of the the uh, SMM or you convert more of the SMM to DMS and uh, then you've volatilized the DMS. It just seems like an easy thing to do, even if you just boil for five, 10 minutes. Sure. Sure. And I recommend a lot of people go to the um, Milk the Funk website and check out the Berliner Weiss uh, recipes there and Goza recipes there. They're pretty solid. And, uh, and like I say, it, it would it would be interesting to visit this again and, and do the same experiment and then just do a simple pasteurization at like 180 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 minutes or so um, instead of the boil to see, you know, if you yeah. still get, you know, that DMS uh, characteristic – um, and if you, if you do, then, you know, then you can narrow it down to, uh, to the boil instead of, you know, may, you know, maybe having the, the variable of, of, it, of it being in the fermenter as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, each experiment creates two or three more. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing. It's a good thing. That's right. Keeps yeah. you in business, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Well, doggone it. Uh, you know, I'm kind of disappointed that uh, Steve and I didn't get to uh, try this one because I, I have a feeling that we could probably have picked the odd sample out. On yeah, this one. but you need you need one of you to get it right, one of you to get it wrong. <laughs> this would have just been like, you know, another tie because I just don't I don't see you getting it wrong. <laughs> I have another beer coming up. Well, I'll send you some beer, Steve. There, there, there we go. James, James, you and Steve. Yeah. We're interchangeable. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a uh, we have a couple loaded up. I can't give any more details than that, but uh, I'll send them to you, and you and Steve can taste them, and then we'll talk about it. Awesome. It sounds like a deal. All I, right. I appreciate it, Malcolm. Thanks, James. Always. Thanks again to Malcolm and to Marshall. Malcolm wanted me to give uh, credit to Dr. Daniel Hilsheim for his work with the chemical analysis of Malcolm's experiment. So appreciate that. Uh, always fun and informative getting together with the philosophy folks. And uh, Steve and I are still tied. <laughs> Remember, next week is an off week. I hope that you have a great time with uh, your family and your loved ones. And uh, no, <laughs> they can be the same. Your family can be your loved ones. <laughs> Those aren't necessary. There's a Venn diagram, probably. <laughs> uh, in the meantime, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to James at uh, basicbrewing.com. Or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our support link 
where you can throw a couple of bucks into the tip jar by subscribing financially to our podcasts. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. Get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo, and you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store, too. You can find our logbooks, where you can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. Check all that out at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. Man, there's a bunch of stuff this week. Uh, greatly appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that are purchased through the link are Squatty Potty Unicorn Gold Toilet Spray, <laughs> Mystic Forest, and <laughs> Victorinox 8-inch Fibrox Pro Chef's Knife with Frustration-Free Packaging. And I think it's important if you're going to get a big old, you know, sharp chef's knife that you don't get frustrated as soon as you get it out of the box. So, <laughs> good planning. <laughs> Thanks again, everybody. And remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate your support. And don't forget you can also join the American Homebrewers Association and subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com. Well, that's all. Until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is brought by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. Ho, ho, ho. Oh.